Hey everybody, welcome back to the Financial Freedom Show. My name is Rob Berger and this is the live stream edition. So I am live, hopefully, and having all kinds of problems this morning, but hopefully things are working. Finally got the lights on so you can see me, whatever that's worth. Um, but I wanted to start doing regular live streams to answer your questions. You've sent in portfolios for me to look at. You've got questions about investing and retirement. And uh, so this is my opportunity to start answering those questions. I'm going to start doing live streams regularly. Uh, won't be any next week, but there will be some beginning pretty regularly the week thereafter. So if you don't want to miss them, subscribe and hit that bell. That will notify you through YouTube when I go live. So that's the plan. Got a lot of great questions uh, that you've sent in that I'm going to cover today. For those of you that join uh, live, um, I will happy to field any questions you have, um, although I'm going to have to make sure I can use all of the <laughs> computer equipment that's all around me. I wish you could see this. I'll do a behind the scenes video maybe. Kevin, thanks for joining from Lakeland, Florida. I've actually been to Lakeland, Florida. It's been a while though. Um, love Florida, not so much in the summer, but uh, love their taxes, no income tax. Anyway, um, so if you, if you join live and you have questions, if you want to put your portfolio into the live stream, the chat, um, that's great. Just put the ticker. I don't need dollars, just tickers and kind of rough percentages and happy to give you my two cents uh, on your portfolio. And I promise it'll be worth every penny. Some ask what I'm doing um, when I'm not live streaming um, or recording a video. Let's see. There you go. That's what I do. A lot of chess. In fact, I've been solving puzzles this morning. Here's a new one. I'll leave it up for a few minutes. White to move. What do you think the move is? Uh, this is not a chess uh, channel, but there you go. By the way, I haven't looked at this one, so I have no idea what the move is. These get kind of difficult. Um, so that's what I've been doing this morning. I got a new computer. Hopefully all this works. I am going to start with a great question sent in by someone named Steve, uh, who asks about when you're retired, you got to juggle rebalancing your portfolio, right? And you got to juggle taking money out. And so how do those two things work together? That's sort of our, that's our, our first question of the day we're going to tackle. Um, uh, Ari and Mike and Jamie, thanks for joining. Oh, Jamie's already got an answer to the puzzle. Queen to A4 question mark. So um, if you don't know what that means, well, the queen, I think we all know there's the queen. A4 is this square here. And you can see they're lettered across the bottom, numbered up to the top. That would be a check. So that, you know, that's interesting. Um, it, you know, it's funny the parallels between investing and really finances generally and chess. One of the principles in chess when you're evaluating a position like this where who knows what the right move is, is to start with sort of the, the, the what they call the forcing move. So, for example, putting a king in check. If we play queen to a4, Black has to deal with that because the king's in check, right? If we play queen day four, you know, Black can't just decide to move his knight over here, right? He's got to deal with the check. Same is true, by the way, if we play bishop uh, to b5, right? Um, it's a forcing move. And there are other less forcing moves that are still forcing, like you attack your opponent's queen. It's not as forcing, uh, but it's still generally, usually, you know, something that the other side's got to pay attention to. And I think investing and finances in general are the same way. When I'm when I'm dealing with a difficult issue, and for me, they might be, for example, uh, how to structure a, a, a business. You know, what what do I use LLC? Should it should the LLC be taxed as an S corp? Uh, should it be a disregarded entity? Uh, should it, should they be owned by a revocable living trust? Issues that I've not really talked much about on the show, but happy to if those are of interest to you. Um, uh, I, I always start with the basics and what are the sort of the givens? What are the, the absolute truths that I need to deal with and only deal with the complications when I have to? And in chess, it's the same way. So like if I'm evaluating this position, my just like Jamie said, my, one of my first things is going to be, well, what if I move queen to a4? Or what if I move bishop to b5, right? Um, another one might be a capture. For example, can I capture this knight? That's a foreseen move. Now, of course, bishop can take my queen, but then I've got a check here, right? And unless he wants to lose his queen, he's got to move his knight here. But the way that I can take it. So I'm thinking, yeah, I like this. Boom. Boom. Right? See, now I think that's right. Yeah. 
There you go. There's the answer. All right, enough chess. Um, there are parallels, though. In fact, b back in the day, I did a door roller post when I owned the site door roller. I don't own it anymore about the parallels between chess and finances. If you actually Google it, maybe you'll find it. All right, enough chit chat. Let's get to the questions. And as I mentioned, the first one comes um, from Steve. Here it is. He says, hey, Rob, Steve here from New York. By the way, I don't know if Steve's in the live stream. I mentioned today that I was going to do this. He says, hi, Rob, Steve here from New York. I just had a quick question and wanted your take on it. I've asked in the past on DR Facebook group. Now, what's that? That's a door roller Facebook group. Uh, again, door roller is a site I owned and sold. I'm not active in the Facebook group anymore. I don't own it. Uh, I pop over there from time to time, but it's a great Facebook group. And the people there are terrific. If you have questions, you know, I think it's a great Facebook group to join. He says, I've asked in the past on the best way to rebalance uh, to rebalance slash withdrawals, also seen some of your insightful videos. It seems the best of both worlds is to rebalance uh, asset allocation first. So, you know, your percentages, you know, it's three fund portfolio, six fund portfolio, whatever your, 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 your recipe is, it's really what it is, a recipe for investments, rebalance it back to, you know, to, to, to your plan. He says, sell high and buy low, then, then withdraw proportionally from each of the funds, in his case, stock and bond index funds for whatever the amount is for your yearly spend. He, he points out we use the three fund portfolio, uh, which I see uh, others use from the chat. Um, and uh, I have a lot to say about the three fund portfolio, including in some upcoming videos. Anyway, he says, just seems to make sense to me. I've been going around for a few months thinking about the best way, but this sounds like the direction I want to go. What are your thoughts? Now, it's a great question. He mentions that his money is in Roth. So here's the deal. Let's assume for a moment that all of your money is in Roth. First of all, congratulations. I'm very, very jealous. Within a Roth, assume, and then we're going to assume that your all your distributions will be what are called qualified distributions, so you won't pay any taxes. Honestly, it doesn't matter how you do it, right? If you if, if you think about it, you could pull out the money first and then rebalance, uh, or you could rebalance first. If you do that, as he pointed out, if you rebalance first, then when you take the money out, you have to take it out in the right percentages from each mutual fund, or you'll screw up the rebalancing you just did, right? So you can make it simple. Let's just say we had a 50-50 allocation and you rebalance first, and then you, you take the money out, but you take it all out of the stock fund. Well, now you no longer have 50-50, right? So if you rebalance first, when you go to take the distributions, uh, you, you need to make it out, you know, take them out proportionally. If everything's in a Roth, it's fairly simple. Do whatever, I think it doesn't matter. It's whatever is convenient for you. But here's where things get difficult. Um, most people don't have all their money in a Roth. You probably have some taxable investments. You have some traditional retirement investments, at least we do. You have some Roths. Maybe you have some HSAs in there that you probably treat as Roths, maybe, but you might be factoring all of, all of, all of that in. And if that's the case, I think it's very difficult to rebalance first and then take out proportionally. Why? Because you're likely not going to want to take money out of certain accounts. So, if, so in my case, I want to take out money first from taxable accounts, right? Um, obviously, dividends that I've received that I've already gotten taxed on. But even beyond that, if I'm going to take out, sell some shares, probably going to sell them from our traditional fund first. Now, I'm not 59 and a half. If I were, though, and I could take out money from, say, a 401k or an IRA without penalty, that would still be the case. I mean, generally, there's exceptions to everything. Taxable accounts first, then traditional, and then Roth at the end, you kind of want you, you want your Roth to grow as big and fat as it can get, in my view. So um, because of that, it would be very hard to take out from every account proportionally, right? Um, just I just don't think it's a practical matter you could do it. I certainly think about our own accounts. I, I couldn't do it. So for me, it's better to, to take out first based on mainly tax considerations and then rebalance. And the rebalancing gets tricky. And in fact, I'm working on a whole separate video on something called opportunistic rebalancing. You can check, if you Google it, you can check it out. Um, in fact, I can show you, I'll give you a little um, advanced look. Um, let me put on the screen here. This is the paper that my video is going to be based on. So you can just Google that. Opportunistic rebalancing new par paradigm for wealth managers. That's, and I'm looking at it. Yeah, it's right. Okay. It's funny. I look over at my screen to my right and it's upside down. 
I hope it's not upside down for you guys, but whatever. Am I upside down? You maybe leave a comment. I hope I'm not upside down. Anyway, um, I've got a new PC over here. I'm a Mac person, but I got a new gaming PC. This thing is unbelievably fast. But when I show you my screen, on the PC, it's backwards. It's not upside down. It's reversed. I don't know. Maybe you can let me know. Ah, good. Guest one says, no, you are good. All right, good. So I'm doing a video on this. You don't have to read the paper now if you don't want to, um, but that's coming up. So, but back to Steve's question, I think it gets really difficult if you don't want, there are certain fonts, certain accounts you might not want to take money from, like a Roth, for example, um, or an HSA. So it, it, it would get difficult, I think, to rebalance first and then try to take out proportionally from everything. I'll add one other thing. This is where, and again, I got another video coming on this, but when I started investing 30 years ago and I learned about index funds and asset allocation, one of the first books I read, and I highly recommend it, it's as good today as it ever was, is all about asset allocation. It's written by my good friend, I didn't know him at the time, he's now a good friend, Rick Ferry. He was a former asset manager, had his own firm, a billion dollars under management, and he charged really low fees. I think his fee was like 37 basis points or something. Um, Anyway, uh, all about asset allocation. Great book. And he and I have discussed this very issue. When you're when you're new to it, you, you get into it and you start looking at small cap value and REITs and emerging markets and you want to slice and dice your portfolio and you wish you had access to Dimensional Funds Advisor, but you don't funds because they have some really cool index funds. And you try to, you know, you, you try to map that out to Vanguard and it's not perfect. And you wish Vanguard had better index funds or at least more interesting, unique ones. And you end up with a six or eight or 10 fund strategy. Well, when you fast forward and, you know, you've done this for 30 years and yet now you and your wife, in my case, we have like a dozen different accounts that we can't really avoid because we've each got Roths and we've each got rollovers and we've got a taxable account and I have two HSAs and she has one and I have a 401k. You start to realize, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure 10 different kinds of funds are really the way to go. So I'm actually moving, I'm at six funds right now. I'm going to be down to five different uh, funds. Now, remember, this is mutual funds. It's not asset classes. You can have a gazillion different asset classes in a single mutual fund, right? I mean, here, I'll, I'll show you one. Let's go right here. This is VT. I've been looking at this for a, a video I'm going to be doing. This is Vanguard Total World Stock Fund. It has U.S. stocks. It has um, international stocks within the U.S. stocks. It's got small cap. It's got mid cap. It's got large cap. In fact, we can look at the weighting. It doesn't have a ton of small cap. And that's where the trick comes in. People look at this and say, oh, 4%. I, I got to have 7 I got to have 7% or I got to have 10%. And if that's you, I get it. That was me um, back in the day. But over time, I've realized that, yeah, it's, the odds of that actually allowing me to outperform a simple three fund portfolio, maybe but I wouldn't bank on it. And if I do outperform, it's probably not going to be by much. And it makes, particularly when you get to the time of taking money out and having to rebalance, really complicated. The fewer funds you can deal with, they may cover a gazillion different asset classes, but if you can, if you can get them down into just a couple of funds, and I think three funds is the sweet spot for most people, myself included, um, the better. So Steve, hope that helps. Uh, like I said, I'm at six funds now because I have emerging markets, REITs, small cap, and then your basic U.S. stock fund, international fund, and bond fund. Um, the REITs are the first thing to go, and that's easy for me because you always want to keep REITs in a retirement account because they're not tax efficient. So I can sell my REITs, my REIT fund, um, and move it into what, for my case, will be a U the U.S. stock portion. So I'm not changing my stock bond allocation at all. I'm just taking the REITs part of it, which I include as part of a stock, the stock allocation and moving it into US, uh, just a VTI or some sort of total stock market fund. Um, that's easy to do. And, you know, keep in mind, you know, the S&P 500 has REITs in it. You know, you have 500 companies, they include actual REITs in the S&P 500. And of course, the total stock market fund has REITs. Now, it's not a ton, two and a half, three percent, somewhere in there. It's so like if you're just dying to have 10% in REITs, yeah, you got to have a separate fund, but I'm telling you, it complicates your life. Anyway, just checked in the chat. Um, good confirmation that I'm not reversed. Chris, if I were reversed, you might not know. I'm not sure. But if the, the screen were reversed, you'd know. Uh, Ari asks, any thoughts about the European version of the three-fund portfolio? 
80% VWCE, 20% EUNA. We don't have access to VTI or VXS in Spain, huh? So I've never heard, well, of course, VTI and VXUS, I know well. VTI is the total US stock market fund, Vanguard's the ETF version. They also have a mutual fund version. VXUS, you can think about the ticker, Vanguard, except that's the X, US, so it's international. These other two, I don't know. So let's, this is good, this is good. We'll, we'll, we'll learn together. So I'm just going to Morningstar. I'm going to put in the ticker uh, VWCE. So I'm guessing it's a Vanguard fund and nothing comes up. Come on. Really? Huh. Is that ticker correct? I'm going to Google it. Well, huh. Why doesn't it come up in, uh, that's weird. It doesn't come up in, maybe because it's um, not a US based fund. Vanguard FTSE, that's what that is. Financial Times, why do I, uh, Stock Exchange, I think. Hey, cool people call it FTSE. Anyway, I think it's, I think that's what it stands for. Um, all world. So uh, yeah, this is not gonna be helpful. Well, maybe they'll give us the portfolio. Oh, here we go. So that's a, it looks like a world fund, right? 57% is in US. I'm looking at it there. I don't know how well you guys can see that. Let me make it a little bigger. And then it shows you um, allocations by other countries, right? But it's basically a world fund, I guess, just like the title suggests, right? I don't know. It'd be interesting um, to know how that compares to FT. Let me um, go to Bloomberg and see what they say. I'll have to dig into this one. I don't want to spend more time. I'll have to look at that one. All right. I, that one I don't know. E, let me just check the other one real quick. I don't know why it's not. I mean, I thought Morningstar covered. It must be because. I tell you, let me just, I'll back up and talk generally. I've gotten a lot of email from folks that don't live in the U.S. who are frustrated because you don't have access to a lot of the funds we talk about. And I'll be honest with you, I don't get it. I don't know why you don't. So I'm going to I'm gonna research that and get back to you. And I'm going to do a video on, for you folks that don't live in the U.S., how we can create these things. Now, so give me some time on that one because that's going to take some research. Now, uh Another folk, another, let's see, Zikabos, I don't know, I'm probably mispronouncing that, asked this question. He says, should the same six funds be across tax deferred and taxable accounts? Absolutely not. So this is the term, if you want to research this, the term you would Google is asset location. That's the, I don't know, it's the term. And it deals with what investments should you hold in what type of accounts? And again, I've literally am mapping out a whole video on asset location that I'm going to put together. Um, but there's some, a couple of definite no-nos. You never want to hold a REIT in a taxable account. Why? So if you think about a public company, Apple, most public companies, maybe all of them in the U.S., I think have to be C-Corps. In any event, they get taxed on their profits. So Apple makes a dollar in profit, it gets taxed. Then if it wants to pay us a dividend, we get taxed. If it's in a taxable account, if it's in a tax deferred, we eventually get taxed. So there's sort of this double taxation that goes on. REITs more or less can avoid the double taxation, right? But to do that, they've got to follow some rules. One of, one of them is they've got to pay out, pretty sure the percentage is 90% of their, of their income to, 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 to the shareholders. Uh, and so, so one, that's why you see yields on REITs are usually very high, at least higher than, let's say, an S&P 500. And to make matters worse, when we get that, we're generally taxed at the ordinary income levels. We don't get long-term capital gains treatment. So REITs kind of are a double whammy on taxes. And so you really want to, I mean, there, I, there's always an exception, I'm sure, maybe. But by and large, you want to hold REITs in a taxable account. Another sort of obvious one this one isn't part of a six fund portfolio, uh, but I'll mention it. So six funds are usually a U.S. stock, international stock, a bond fund. This is my version of six fund. 
uh, emerging markets, uh, REITs and small caps, right? Uh, but another one is munis. So munis, municipal bond funds, generally don't, they have favorable tax stream. You don't have, you don't have federal income tax. As a result of that, your yields on a muni are usually lower than say a comparable fund uh, where there is tax. If you're in a high tax bracket though, you're willing to accept that lower yield because on an after-tax basis, you'll do better, right? That's the theory. So like if you're you know, making millions of bucks and you live in New York or California or whatever, and your, your marginal rate is over 50%, you know, a muni can make good sense, but you would never put it in a tax a deferred, like a, a 401k or an IRA or a Roth, because you, you don't get any tax benefits there, right? There are no taxes, at least while you're investing. So a muni, you always want to hold in a taxable account. Beyond that, um, the general rule has always been you kind of want to keep bonds in a, in a tax advantaged retirement account. Why? Because they pay out interest, you know, it's some sort of income, and it's usually ordinary income. Again, there are always exceptions, and some bonds, you know, don't have state income tax, you know. But by and large, the only thing I would add to that is two things. One is yields are so low. I, I kind of wish I had more bonds in my taxable account because <laughs> they're not paying anything. Um, so there's that. But the other thing I would say is, uh, for particularly for Roth accounts, you really want you want your Roth accounts to get, get as big and fat as they possibly can. As my mom would say, you want to be as fat as a tick. Um, she doesn't say that about Roths, by the way. But if she were, that's what she would say, because they're you know the tax advantages. And if you're going to leave inheritance to folks, Roths can be a great way to do it. And obviously, if you're going to spend it in retirement, you know it's 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 you know there's no taxes when you take it out. So you want your Roths to be as big as they can get. So I would never put bonds in a Roth. I'd put them in a traditional, maybe some in a taxable account potentially. Um, so that's my two cents on it. I will do a complete video on that. Um, let's see what else we got. Born again bride asks, what kind of CFA professional should a near retiree hire to advise? Not interested in buying products. You are outstanding by the way. Oh, thank you. Um, so I'll tell you who I, I use. I use an advisor. They don't manage my investments. Um, and I don't have any financial relationship with this person at all. Um, I'll show you on the screen. Oh, there we go. So his name is Mark Zorl. This is his company, Plan Vision. It's actually the, tick, uh, the ticker. The URL is Plan Vision MN. I think that stands for Minnesota, but I, I may be wrong. PlanVisionMN.com. I actually met Mark online. I did a, um, actually did a, uh, a podcast, $96, um, it was like $96 investment advisor. Let's see if it comes up first. Huh. Door roller, here it is. Yeah, I did this podcast. It says December 10 to 2020, but they just updated the article. This was years ago. Um, in any event, he, he charges, I mean, it's, it's nothing. I mean, I'm, I, I don't know, his current rate may have gone up, but it was something like, well, $96 a year, actually. It's gone up. Um, and he's all he's modernized his, his setup. So you, you do all this stuff um, online in terms of connecting all your accounts. He uses eMoney Advisor, which is a financial tool only available to advisors. But as a client of his, you'd get access to it. Um, and he'll look at your asset allocation. He'll talk to you about Social Security, about insurance. Should you buy an annuity? Should you should, should you you know buy an indexed annuity? No, uh, probably not. But in any event, um, and so I, I like Mark. We talk usually. We email. I just emailed him the other day about um, whether there are any tools to help you automate rebalancing. Actually, and he's actually got one coming maybe down the road. Um, but in any event. Um, even if you don't use Mark, uh, I would definitely look for a fee only. Um, and by fee only, I, the problem is those that want to manage your money on an assets under management, you know, like one percent, they're fee only. That's 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 technically fee only. But what I mean is someone is going to charge you either like a flat fee, like Mark does, or an hourly fee. So there could be others out there. Um, Mark, I think at one point Rick Ferry did that. I don't know if he still does. What I would love to do, by the way, is put together a list of, of advisors who just charge you an hourly rate or a, a flat fee 
to look at your portfolio or to answer whatever questions you have. Mark is the one that, that I know best and I've used. Again, I have no financial connection with Mark. My only financial connection with him is I pay him 96 bucks a year. That's my financial connection. I, I wish I got money for recommending him. I don't get any money from Vanguard either. I do get money. I do have other um, relationships. Like I, I get money from M1 Finance, not very much, but if someone opens an account and, and there's a certain amount of money they have to deposit, I, I make a little bit of money. Anyway, so that's my answer to your question. I hope, I hope it helps. Um, what else we got? Let's see. What camera are you using? Uh, I am using a Sony Alpha, a Sony A6400. Hang on for a second. Let me, um, I should put a link. I should put a link in below each video of all of my equipment. Because, um, But let me see if I can find it real quick. I think I have it right here. Hang on. I'll have to pull it up. But anyway, this is a, this is a Sony A6400. A6400. Let me just let me make sure I've got that right. And it's not um, it's not a particularly expensive camera. I think it was 800 bucks. Maybe it's a little more. Um, here it is. I'll show you on the screen. This is the camera right here. Um, whoops. There we go. That's the camera. I have a basic lens. I don't even know which one now because it's been so long since I set it up. And it's actually behind a teleprompter. So I have a teleprompter. You can probably tell I don't read my videos. <laughs> Maybe some of you wish I did. Anyway, um, but it, it helps me when, on video calls. So rather than like, talking to someone while I look at them over here on my computer screen like this, I can look directly at the camera and I see their face. Right now, I just see a blue screen. In any event, that's the camera I use. What else we got? Uh, D asks, and by the way, I, I've got I've got like another ten or fifteen minutes, and I need to run, uh, getting a haircut. Anyway, uh, I will. Um, I'm gonna like I said, I'm gonna be doing these regularly, um, starting not next week but the week after. I had a bunch of other questions that I plan to get to, but I kind of feel like I want to answer the chat's questions since you guys are kind enough to join. Um, and, if, and for those questions I plan to get to that I didn't, I'll cover them on the next live stream because I emailed some of you, so I promise. All right, D asks, I have a Vanguard target date fund with 25% in bonds, okay? What I see is that bonds have had negative earnings in the past few years. Should I dump the target date and just add to my stock mutual funds? Well, so first of all, if you have a target date and it's 25% in bonds, that tells me it's probably a 2025 fund. It's not a long term because like a 2060 fund is going to be like 90% stocks. So let's see here. Vanguard, let's just try 2030. That's probably, let's see what we get. In terms of what I'm looking at is asset allocation, right? So uh, I'll show you on the screen. I'm looking at this. I'm just looking at it in Morningstar. We could look at it at Vanguard. We're going to go to the portfolio. So fixed income is 33. Okay, so maybe it's a 2035 fund. Let's see if I can see what 2035 looks like. Anyway, um, but the other thing you've said in your question that's interesting to me is you said, should I just sell it and add it to my stock fund? Well, that tells me that, that, the, that the target date retirement fund, yeah, here it is. Fixed income is right around 25%. So maybe you have the 2035 fund. But that tells me that the target date retirement fund is not your only fund, right? I mean, it could be that the idea of a target date retirement fund is sort of one and done, right? There it is, toss everything in. It gets more and more conservative as you get to um, retirement, right? It's not the only way to go. I've generally not used target date retirement funds, um, but I think they're perfectly reasonable choices. But it's telling me you have other funds. That in and of itself isn't... Um, isn't a problem necessarily, but you do need to know what's your asset allocation. It's not going to be as easy as just looking at the Vanguard 2035 fund if you have other funds. So you can you can figure that out by hand. You can use a tool like Morningstar. You can use a tool like Personal Capital, connect your accounts, but you, you want to know your overall asset allocation. I feel your pain on, on bonds. The first thing I want to say is um, bonds haven't actually lost money. 
so, so you have to understand if we're talking about mainly high, high grade, you know, investment grade bonds or U.S. Treasuries, that is bonds that don't have significant what they call credit risk, which is a risk of default, which is a, a risk that the borrower is going to go belly up and not pay. You, okay, uh, then uh, the main risk is interest rates, right? And as interest rates go up, the value of bonds go down. Existing bonds. Um, as interest rates go go down, the value of bonds go up. But that's not the whole story, right? Because let, let's take the scenario where interest rates go up. Yes, interest rates go up, the value of existing bonds go down. That's the first part of the story. What's the second part? The second part is, is that these funds down here that just went down in value um, are going to start uh, over time. They constantly are buying and selling bonds. I mean, you know, Vanguard's D&D bond fund probably has, I don't know, 13 or 14,000 different bonds. I mean, it's, it's unreal how many bonds these, these funds manage. I'll, we'll look it up. Here's, uh, here's B&D portfolio. See how many bonds they have. Watch, it'll be like four. <laughs> no, it's not. I'm telling you, it's at least 10,000. There we go. Look at that. Right there it is. 18,000 bonds in that bond fund. All right. So, yes, interest rates go up. Let's assume bonds go down. Uh, the, the value of the fund goes down. But what's happening? Well, they're constantly buying and selling. So now when they sell a bond and buy a new one, they're getting this higher yield up here, right? Because remember, rates went up. So they're, they're either buying fresh new bonds that, that are being issued at this higher rate, or maybe they're buying existing bonds, but, but because rates went up, just like their value went down, they're being able to buy bonds that effectively have higher yields. So over time, roughly the duration of the fund, it's going to balance itself out. Um, and if we look at like, um, well, let's look at this fund, for example. Let me put it back up on the screen. If we look at performance, what's interesting about this current year, now this, let's see. So like, yeah, look, I mean, it's off year to date. It's off 60 basis points. Last year was up 7%. Year before that, it was up 8 So it, they really haven't lost money, even as yields are low. And if we look at a, a treasury fund, um, some of the best investments recently, recently meaning the last few years, have been long-term treasury bonds because interest rates keep going lower. People you know, think they're going to go up, and they don't. Now, someday they're going to go up, I think, right? And yeah, bonds could be ugly. But to answer your question, D, bonds... Yeah, bonds are expensive, which is another way to say the yields are really low. But so are stocks. Stocks are expensive. Uh, my approach, I don't j jettison my bonds. I'm still uh, overall an 80-20 investor. That includes some individual stocks. Um, most of my bonds are short term. Uh, I have some that are intermediate term. I don't have any that are long term. I I'm by no means can, can tell you that that's going to be give me the best outcome. I mean, we don't think rates could go lower, but what, what happens when they do? I mean, I don't know. What happens when the 10-year goes negative? It's possible, right? Um, so, you, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into this question, and I feel your pain. Um, but I'm not convinced that the answer, for me anyway, is to go 100% stocks. Now, I don't know your age. I don't know your, how much debt you have. I don't know your financial goals. So you have to consider all of that. Um, but even if I were younger, and still had decades to go before I sleep. Is that what we say? Um, I'd probably still have some bonds, even if it's 10%. That's my approach. All right. How am I doing on time? Uh, let's see. What is an example of, it says, this is from Bill. What is an example of, I think you meant REIT, maybe just a typo, in Vanguard? Sure. Um, so, uh, now I'm trying to think of the, I don't know the ticker off the top of my head, but we'll just Google Vanguard REIT. There it is, VGSLX, that's a mutual fund. I don't know, yeah, I thought they had, they also have an ETF here. So those are two examples. VGSLX, which I've owned in the past, actually, I think I still do own it. You know, I probably should, I, oh, you're, I can see, you know, you can't see my screen. There we go, VGLSLX. It's funny, I say, I think I still own it. I probably should know. Yeah, I do own it. And then VNQ is the, the ETF version. So there you go. I'll get through as many of these as I can before I got to run. Let's see here. Um, looking through. Rob, thanks for the compliment. And great name, by the way. Really good name. I like your name. Uh, let's see. Has there been any updates to your investment tracker spreadsheet? Because I'm having trouble with mutual funds not ETFs loading, huh, with updated information. I, okay, I am going to do an update on the spreadsheet. Um, 
where I'm adding some features to it. Uh, but I, I've not I've not changed. Hmm. Let me just make sure. I was to say I haven't changed the actual spreadsheet that you guys see, but that actually may not be true. I may be lying. So here's the article about it. Here's the spreadsheet. Uh, no, I haven't changed it. So, so this is all sort of quote unquote fake data uh, or a demo portfolio. Can you, yeah. Um, yeah, they're loading. So I don't know what the deal is. So, so the way this works, by the way, make it a little bigger. So the account name you could put in for yourself and I, I, I'll do a more detailed explainer for this because I know I got a lot of questions. But if you look at the ticker, that's actually typed in and VGSLX, there you go, right? There's our REIT. But if you look at this cell, it's a formula. And this is the formula, Google Finance. Uh, it just references the B3 is the, the ticker cell. And then name tells Google, Google effectively, hey, for this ticker, give us the name. There it is. Um, this says the same thing, except it says for the same ticker, now we want the price. And it gives us the price. Um, the change is the change, right? And they, so Google Finance exposes some some functions that you can use in Google Sheets uh, that you know helps you do things like this. Um, I am so I am doing an update um, on it, and then I'll do another video on it um, as soon as I can. But yeah, the the tickers should still bring in the names. I'm not sure why you're having trouble. Sometimes Google Finance just craps out for a bit, so that that might be. Um, the answer. Let's see. Oh, year to date info. Yeah, I'm not sure why that's a problem. I'll, I'll look into it more, but I'm not seeing any problems with the sheet I just showed you. So Slim says, I know a way to get fee only advisors as a starting point. Well, don't leave us in suspense, Slim. Oh, two resources. Here we go. Thank you. Garrett, G-A-R-R-E-T-T -T Planning Network and NAPFA, N-A-P-F-A. I know of both. I've not used them, so check it out. Amir asks, what software are you using for this stream? None. Well, all right. I really should do a behind the scenes thing. So I just go into YouTube and I do a live stream. I'm, I'm pointing over here, by the way, because I wish I could show you, but I've got a big Samsung G7 32-inch monitor. It's curved. It's kind of cool. Part of the PC I just bought. I got a Threadripper 32 core. I'm just going to say that right now with the 3080. Didn't want to go 3080 Ti or 3090. Just the money just didn't seem worth it. And this was expensive enough as it is. But this thing is freaking fast. Anyway, that's just YouTube. Um, when you see me switching, let me see. Actually, maybe I'm going to try to hold this up. Yeah, without unplugging it. This is just a streamer, a switcher. It's a Roland VR One HD, and it allows me to hit a button and do that or that. And there's another button I can hit to show you my my iPad, but I don't have it connected. Um, but there, that's it. Um, when I record a video, I use a Roland software that just records it, VR capture. But that's it. No streaming software for me. It's all in this streamer. The nice thing about it, when I'm recording a video and I want to cut over to here and show you something on the screen and then cut back, I do that while I'm recording so there's no post-production editing. Yeah, there you go. hope that's helpful. Um, how am I doing on time? All right. I'll get to as many of these as I can. Um, Rob, what is the best way to withdraw from your IRA if you have company stock to minimize taxes? This is from Jerry. Jerry, I... Don't quite understand the question. If you have an IRA, an IRA and in it you have company stock, right? You can sell within an IRA, keeping the money in there. Don't pull it out. Keeping it in the IRA, you can sell and buy something else, and that doesn't trigger any taxes. So I don't know if that answers your question. If you pull something out of an IRA, and we're assuming a traditional IRA, then you're going to get taxed. Assuming it's a, what the IRS calls a qualified distribution, so think you're 59 and a half and you followed all of the rules, you won't get that pesky 10% penalty, but whatever you take out will be treated as ordinary income. That's true whether it's company stock, an ETF, mutual fund, whatever. I'm not sure if that answers your question. 
If I've missed it, let me know. Um, let's see. What time of year do you make withdrawals? I don't, I just do it quarterly. I mean, right now we're kind of on the cusp of semi-retirement. We can live off some income that I generate from some consulting that I do from the YouTube channel. Uh, I'm not like, you know, Mr. Beast or anything, you know, whatever. Um, my websites make a little bit of money and then we all, and then we're able to live off of effectively the dividends from our taxable account. They get paid primarily quarterly, so I just pull them out quarterly as I need to. Um, here's a great question that I missed. Quincy, would you keep money in the TSP at retirement or roll it over to someone like Vanguard? So, and I, this is another video I need to do. So I've never owned, the, I've never been a government employee, so I've never had the TSP. Our son has a TSP. Um, my understanding, so the TSP, as those that are in it know, incredibly great low cost investments. It's simple and it should be simple. You can basically achieve the same thing with Vanguard in a rollover IRA, right? Um, my understanding is that there are some hoops, some limitations on how you can take money out of the TSP. And that could cause me to want to roll it over into an IRA and say Vanguard potentially. But that's all I know. I don't know the details about some of the hoops you have to jump through. Like one thing I heard was you, you can't just pick and choose the funds. It comes out of all of them in some equal proportion. That could be wrong, but there's some issue along those lines. But of course, I suppose you could just rebalance, but maybe there are limitations on that too. So, um, you know, the other thing that's nice about, let's say a Vanguard account or any broker for that matter, but you know, you can get check writing privileges and at Fidelity, you can have a debit card and they have more cash management options, frankly, than Vanguard has. Um, but so there could be reasons to move it over. What I don't like to see are companies that scare you out of the TSP. I've seen them, some target postal workers who also have the TSP. And of course, what their aim is, is to get you to hire them so they can charge you either big asset management fees or maybe put you into some ridiculous expensive annuity product. That really angers me when I see that. But if, you, if you're going to manage it on your own, either in the TSP or, say, in a rollover IRA, it's something like Vanguard, I think either one is good. I would probably end up personally doing whatever I thought was the easiest. Um, I will do more homework on the TSP and come up with a video for that because that's important um, to a lot of people. All right. Great question. Frank says, I appreciate your common sense approach and explanations. I am learning. Glad to hear it. Hopefully they're common sense. All right, let's see. Uh, what time of year do you make withdrawals? I answered that. Are you going into funds like Wellington and, and Wellesley at retirement or keeping, or keeping the index? So it's a great question. I'm probably just gonna stick with indexes. I'm slowly moving towards th three funds. Like I said, I'm gonna get rid of the REITs. The reason I'm slowly moving is because small cap is in my taxable account. I'm not gonna sell it and trigger taxes. Um, so that could be with me for a while actually. And that's okay. I'm not. I'm. I'm fine with that. Um, uh, the the problem I have when you have a taxable account, and we we have more money in taxable than retirement, and that may be unusual for for a lot of people. But it makes rebalancing tricky. Like I ended up with all of my U.S. index funds in my taxable account. Well, what happens when it goes up and I want to sell? Well, I can do that, but I got to trigger. I got to pay taxes, and I don't like paying taxes. So that's where I, I I thought. You know, do I really need a separate REIT fund? If I take my REIT fund, which is in a retirement account, and convert it over to, say, a VTI or whatever, some sort of S&P 500 or total stock market, as, and so I've, I've reduced the number of asset classes represented by the mutual fund. I still have REIT exposure, right? S&P 500 has REIT exposure. Total market has REIT exposure. Not to mention that just big, large companies own real estate, right? They're, they're maybe not as a business. They're not in the business of real estate, but you've got plenty of real estate exposure in a broadly diversified portfolio, if that then becomes part of my U.S. allocation, now that gives me something to work with in my retirement accounts if I need to sell some of that to rebalance. So I'm moving towards just the three fund portfolio, uh, you know, not in a hurry, but that's what I'm going to do. So I'm, I could do a video on, on those sorts of Vanguard funds, and I, I will. They're worth looking at, but I'm not going to go that direction. Um, just checking the time. I got another five minutes. Um, 
Let's see what else we got. By the way, I, I'm thrilled that you guys have joined. I'm, I'm loving this. Hopefully you are too. Like I said, not next week, but the week after, I'm going to start doing these at least once a week. Um, and maybe more. Why not? Do you know of a better dashboard than personal capital? I appreciate the retirement planner. Um, I, I don't. Um, I, I use eMoney Advisor through Mark Zorrell. The interface of eMoney Advisor is terrible. But it's, it's really designed for advisors, not for you and me. Um, if you're a client, your advisor can give you access to it, which is what Mark does. But um, the interface is, is terrible. It, it, it's, it's got a ton of features, far more than personal capital does. Although not all of them are available to you and me. Some of them, they do not allow the advisor to give to the client. I don't know, whatever. Um, but I really don't. I mean, um, you know, Morning, Morningstar is good. Um, it's just that you got to enter everything manually. It's a pain. Um, Morningstar probably gives you better asset allocation details and you can x-ray into the portfolio and see exactly what stocks it owns and all this stuff that you can't do with personal capital. Um, but in terms of just like an overall thing, personal capital is probably the best. By the way, personal capital is an advertiser. Um, I get it, it's free to you guys and to me if you're just using the dashboard. Of course, they're using it. Talk about personal capital. You might say, well, boy, that's awfully nice of them. Why did they give us all this great tool for free? Well, they are an asset manager. They want to get your business to manage your portfolio. I think they charge 89 basis points. I don't use them. It's too expensive for me. Um, some people do, and that's fine too. Um, some people pay advisors more. Um, I just use their free tool, um, and I like it a lot. I use it. I probably access it almost every day, probably, <laughs> probably more than I should. Um, yeah. Uh, by the way, they will do an, a, a free um, analysis of your portfolio. I think Vanguard does a free one. By the way, Vanguard's a great one. They're 30 basis points for, I think you have to have at least 50,000, but you get an advisor, you know, um, they're going to analyze your portfolio. You know, they're only going to manage, manage it if it's at Vanguard, with Vanguard funds. Uh, I have no issue with that at all, but I don't use their services either. So I'm a do-it-yourselfer. All right, let's see if I can get one more. I'm trying to debate how long it takes me to get over to get my hair cut. Um, let's see. Quincy says VNQ. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was from an earlier comment. Mike asks, Rob, what is the best, best tax strategy for deferred plans upon separation from the company? Oh, I see, Mike. You just want to ask an easy question. Um, I, I can't answer that question. I, I've had, I, I just, there's too many unknowns. The best tax strategy is to, honestly to hire a tax professional. I, that, that's going to get really complicated. And by the way, if, if, if you're in Spain, that could actually make it even more complicated, potentially. I don't know. But that's one where you just need to spend some money and hire someone. Um, all right. Steven says they own intermediate term treasury bonds, index fund, and the Roths. Okay. Um, it's a way to go. I, I like to keep equities in my Ross, but but at the same time, our Ross are tiny. I wish we had more, more in Ross. We don't. I mean, really small, a fraction of a percent. I mean, I missed out on that one. Um, this is from Peter. What combined tax bracket do you think Roth contributions make sense? Does having a pension change your recommendations? Um, I'm generally, I'm a big fan of Roths. Uh, you can you can find calculators. The, here's the problem. You can find calculators that will try to answer that question. The problem is we have no idea what taxes are going to look like tomorrow, let alone next year, 10 years from now. So there's no way to really know. I generally, if someone were in the lowest tax bracket, uh, you know, you got you got to factor in state income tax too. Um, uh, you know, then Roths to me are a no-brainer, right? Um, if you're at the top tax bracket and you live in California, then, you know, probably traditional. Where does that, where do you cross the line? When does it become, I, I, it's just, there's too many unknowns. Um, certainly, if you're in the, the, the first sort, say, I don't know, three tax brackets, federal. Um, I'm just looking them up now. What is it? Is it 10? I don't even remember. I don't even know. 10, 12, 15. What do we got here? Yeah. Uh, oh. Single filers, 10, 12, 22. I'm looking, I'll show you what I'm looking at. 
This is on Nerd Wallet. This is single filers. 10, 12, 22. I'd, I'd probably even, I would probably, for me, I'd probably be in Ross at 24. You know, also keep in mind, this is marginal. It depends how much you have in each one. Um, uh, I'm a big believer in Roth. So, you know, but you're going to have to factor in your in, your state. If you, you know, 24 in California versus 24 in Tennessee are going to be vastly different. Um, the other thing to think about is um, tax diversification. Have a little bit of both. Uh, if, you com- if you contribute to a Roth 401k and you get employer matches, they're going to come in in the form of traditional, right? Not Roth. Keep that in mind. Um, I heard that might change. I don't know. I, maybe I misread that. I read something recently about that. Um, so, Peter, I know that's probably not a satisfactory answer. I, I would err on the side of Roths, but once you get up to the upper brackets, and that's certainly true if the, the top bracket goes from 37 to whatever, 39.6, you, 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 you know, you've got Affordable Care Act tax issues that play into that. Um, there's just a lot of different scenarios. And again, your state. Um, it, it, it can it, it, the the calculations can get tricky, but I'm a big fan of Roths. Um, all right, I'm out of time. Listen, thanks for hanging out with me. Hope you enjoyed this. Uh, I know I didn't get to some of the questions, and I emailed folks that said I would. I promise I haven't forgotten about you. I'll do another stream beginning not next week, but early the week after. So if you subscribe to the YouTube channel and and hit that bell, it'll tell you when I'm. When I'm online, I'd like to be able to tell you I'll be on uh, live streaming the same time every whatever week or, or twice a week or whatever. But right now, I just don't have the uh, I, I can't commit to that yet. So I'll work on it. But um, love it, man. Appreciate you guys. And if you have any questions, you know, leave them in the comments below. I'll add them to the next stream. Till next time. Remember, best thing money can buy is financial freedom. <laughs>